Hello again, this is Rabbi Jeff Sachs of Atzid and Web Yeshiva with another installment in our Modern Jewish History series entitled Jews, Judaism, and Modernity. Uh, at this leg of the journey, we have turned our attention to the East, as they say, and we're talking about the history of the Jews in Eastern Europe. Um, in the chat panel, I'm putting a link uh, to a site that has some of the archived MP3s of um, uh, just the MP3s without the benefit of the full interactive and the board and etc. but just the uh, audio recordings of some of the previous uh, uh, sessions in this course where we were talking about Western Europe and I'm going to make reference to some of them tonight so you're welcome to go back and, and fill in if you weren't part of the part of our group uh, in past semesters. The first uh, link there is to a uh, recording called What's Modern About Modern Jewish History? And that's a kind of introductory discussion to, to, um, to the whole study of modern Jewish history and some methodological questions that have informed what we've been doing together. And I would certainly recommend that if that's of interest to you. Um, we're going to do something, uh, I'd like to do something with you tonight. Um, um, I'm going to do something uh, tonight uh, that's known here in Israel as an unseen. You see this uh, word here, uh, unseen. Um, which is a funny word because it's a Hebrew word which is, um, you know, just borrowed from an English term that we don't actually use in English, at least to the best of my knowledge. It's something that's done in, uh, in history courses very often or in any other kind of text-based text -based, uh, study where uh, a teacher might give the students on, a, on an exam, let's say, uh, a document. It's used often in the study of history uh, because uh, we're inclined to look at documents. Usually what we do in, in our courses, in our classes uh, together, is that we talk about some topic and then we look at some primary document uh, that sheds light on, on the topic at hand. Um, but tonight I'd like to do an unseen. Where we're going to look at this document that you see in front of you, um, and I'm not going to tell you anything at all about it. Uh, who wrote it, when it was written, where it was written, and uh, based upon looking at it, I, I'd like you to think about what's going on here. Who might the author be? I mean, if not, if you don't know precisely who the author is, you might know, uh, you know, what kind of person he is, or why he's writing this, or, or something like that. Uh, when we're done, of course, I'll fill you in and let you know what this is. Uh, let's just look through the let's just look through the text. Yidiat lashon hakodesh lechol bal dat yehudit, the knowledge of the holy tongue, holy tongue being of course Hebrew, to all members of the Jewish faith, who hechrach gadol, is a great necessity. Vile mitzvah raba, and a great mitzvah, a great religious obligation. Techashev lo, it should be considered. V'chein amru chazal, the sages said, Behedya, the sages explicitly said in the Talmud Yerushalmi, Perak Kama of Shabbat, the first chapter of Masechet Shabbat, Hane b'shem Rabbi Meir, ko mi shuhu kavua be'eretz Yisrael v'chulei, u'medaber b'lashon ha'kodesh, Anyone who makes his residence in Israel, in, in the Holy Land, and speaks in Lashon HaKodesh, in Hebrew, Muftach Lo Shehu Olam Habo, is guaranteed life in the world to come. So, the author of this document says, Hebrew is really very important. And he quotes a source, an impeccable religious source from the canon of our tradition, the Talmud Yerushalmi, that says, speaking Hebrew, it's an entry ticket to Olam Haba, to the world to come. 
Then he tells us, Gam Ateret Tiferet Amenu, the crowning glory of our people, the Rambam, Zal, Maimonides. Some of you were with us on Thursday nights. On Thursday nights, I, I, I have a class on the philosophy of the Rambam. So that great figure, Maimonides, the Perushola Avot, in his commentary on Masechet Avot, which happens to be what we're studying together on Thursday nights, at least the introduction to that commentary. So the Rambam, in his commentary to Kirke Avot, says, or, or doesn't, he's paraphrasing him, Nechashev limud lashon hakodesh le mitzvah kechol ha mitzvot hachamurot sheba Torah. So he says that the Rambam equates the study of Hebrew with all of the other mitzvot, the mitzvot hamurot, the weighty mitzvot in the Torah. Source number two. So you have a Yerushalmi and you have a Rambam. Veharav hagadol rabbeinu Yishaya halevi horowitz zatzal besifro shnei luchot habrit. The Shai Halevi Horowitz was known as the Shlo. The Shlo. He wrote a book called the Shnei Luchot Habrit, the Two Tablets of the Covenant. And as is the fashion, uh, great rabbis are sometimes called after the name of their work. And in his case, he's called after the acronym of acronym of the name of his work. He's called the Shlo. Uh, Shia Levi Horowitz lived in the 16th, 17th centuries uh, throughout Eastern and West and, and Central Europe. He was born, I believe, in Prague, and he lived in Germany, in Poland, in different places. His, uh, he's buried in Tiveria, actually right next to or right near the Rambam. So, third source from the Shlo, Hasher Na'atik Lahem Amirotav Ani'imot, Mazhir ma'od alimud lashon hakodesh, betachlit hayoter shlema. So the Shla also exhorted everybody about the importance of studying Hebrew al pi diktuka, to study it grammatically, to study the the dikduk, the the grammar, the details of the Hebrew language. Ad shenuchal galot ba et kol haola al ruchenu al pi atzachut. Until you gain a mastery. Of um, of Hebrew, you you've mastered in such a way that you can express yourself in Hebrew with clarity, with the refinement. And now he quotes the Sifrei. Uh, that great uh, uh, work of Midrash Halacha, Le Daber Bam, like we say in Kriyat Shema, Le Maritem Otam Et Benechem Le Daber Bam. You should teach your children to speak of, assumedly, the Torah, that they may speak of Le Daber Bam, that they may speak about the mitzvot. B'Shiv Techa Bebeitecho, V'Lech Techa Vaderech, V'Shach Techa Vkomecha, all the time. So what does it mean to l'daber bam, to speak about the mitzvot? Mikan amru she'akeshat tinok matchil l'daber, aviv m'daber imo v'lashon ha'kodesh. So that's to teach you that when, from the time a child learns to speak, his father, his parents should start to speak to him in Hebrew. V'im ein m'daber imo v'lashon ha'kodesh, r'oi lo ke'ilu kovro. And if, God forbid, the father doesn't speak to the child in lashon ha'kodesh, it's as if it, 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 it can't amount to, to 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 killing the child. It's as if you're burying him. It's the continuation of Kriyat Shema. It's written, of course, is all written in in rabbinic in rabbinic uh, convention of just making making hints at sources that the author assumes are so familiar that he can just quote a, a half a line and throw in an etc. etc. 
and the audience will know the audience will know to what he's referring to string together these the sources uh, again by quoting he's quoting the Sifre that does this but he's uh, the author that's stringing these sources together is making an assumption about who his audience is that he doesn't have to spell everything out and from the fact that uh, uh, from the fact that uh, we've told you about the importance of Hebrew, so we can also understand the severity of neglecting Hebrew. So this passage is really, I mean, there's, there's hardly anything original here. I mean, you see, it's the first chapter of a work that I'm about to tell you what it is. But th it's really just a stringing together, like a, a string of pearls of three or four sources. Uh, first, he starts off with this general notion that the study of Hebrew is, is, is very important. Then he quotes the Yushalmi. Then he quotes the Rambam. And then he quotes the Shlo, who also fills in the quote from the Sifre. There's, in this whole passage, in this whole passage, there's hardly anything 98% of the whole chapter are direct quotes from primary sources or paraphrases of primary sources because the quote from the Rambam is not 100% precise. Does anyone know? The, the, the Rambam is not a quote. It's a paraphrase of what the Rambam is saying. Does anybody know the context of the Rambam's admonition to study Hebrew? is brought in his commentary on Pirkei Avot. And they won? No. Nope. So the Mishnah in Avot, Perak Bey's Mishnah Aleph, chapter 2, the first Mishnah in chapter 2 of Pirkei Avot, says Havizohir Bemitsa Kala Kebechamura. A person should be as diligent with a light mitzvah, you see I'm making these little air quotes, as with a heavy mitzvah. Why? Because we don't know what the ultimate reward of anything is, and therefore since we don't know Matan Scharan Shal Mitzvot, we don't know how God keeps his books as it were. We have to be careful then. Now, obviously, we know that there are certain mitzvot which are which are uh, severe, and others which are less severe. We might intuit this from we might intuit this from uh, the punishments that are associated with different mitzvot. There are certain mitzvot that are very severe that they carry the death penalty. Uh, there are others that uh, that are less less severe in their punishments, but. Um, the Rambam says you should be as careful with a light mitzvah as you are with a grave mitzvah, a heavy mitzvah, because ultimately we don't know how God keeps his books. We don't know the reward for any specific deed. So in his commentary on Pirkei Avot, the Rambam asks, what is a mitzvah kala, a light mitzvah? And he suggests that a light mitzvah is speaking in Hebrew, speaking in Lashon HaKodesh, Says the uh, says the Rambam. Uh, so the paraphrase here of the Rambam is it's not precise because he tells us that the Rambam that the Rambam equates the the study of Hebrew with the mitzvot hamurot when in fact the Rambam equates or gives the study of Hebrew as an example of a mitzvah kala a light mitzvah which ultimately, of course, you have to be as diligent with as the quote-unquote heavy mitzvot, but the, 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 the paraphrase of the Rambam here is, is slightly imprecise. Does anybody want to venture a guess who the author of this piece is? What his agenda is? Where and when he's writing? Why he's doing this? Why he opens a book? Uh, with this paragraph, what might the rest of the work contain if this is the first the first chapter? 
Any any thoughts on this? I don't know if anybody had a chance to look over the the source sheets that I put up online uh, uh, earlier in the week or at the end of last week. If you did, you you might have been able to fill in some of the blanks here. But anybody have any any thoughts on what this work is about? What what might be behind it? And this is an interactive course. That's why we have these webcams. That's why we're wearing these funny microphones. Think about it for a moment and either post to me uh, in the chat privately so that you don't have to withstand the scrutiny of uh, your colleagues or post publicly or... Okay. Obviously, Brian mentions Chinuch. Obviously, there's an educational program here of some sort. Anybody would like to speak? I can turn on your microphone. Advent of Zionism. That's an interesting idea. Concern of assimilation. Brian, what do you mean by that? Brian, do you have a microphone? No? Mm, can't hear you. Ezra? Yes? Ezra, I'm, I, I'd like Brian to say something, but he seems to be having trouble with his microphone. His lips are moving, but we do not hear him. So Brian, I'm going to ask you to help him out there. Okay, Brian, can you hit the... Okay, Brian, Ezra is going to contact you. Okay, anybody else have any thoughts on this? You may or may not be surprised to discover, ah, uh, Natalia mentions the idea that Hebrew is more important than Yiddish, or Hebrew ought to be more important than Yiddish, and that clearly is something that, that's going on here. Um, th this piece that we just read is the first chapter, the opening, the opening uh, section in a work called the Tudab Yisrael, which was written by Yitzchak Ber Levinson, or Isaac Ber Levinson, sometimes also called Isaac Dove Levinson. You know, Ber, Ber is like Ber, like uh, teddy bear, is Yiddish for the name, the Hebrew name Dove, both of which mean, mean, mean Ber. Uh, he's sometimes known by the acronym Ribal. Uh, Reb Yitzchak Bear Levinson, and uh, correct, uh, correct Robert, um, Levinson was the early leading figure of the Haskalah, of the Jewish Enlightenment in the East. Previously, we discussed at some length the Haskalah, the Jewish Enlightenment in Western Europe primarily in Germany. We talked about Moses Mendelssohn, and we talked about Naftali Hertz Wiesel, and we talked about all types of other things. Um, and uh, you can go back to those, to those archives. That was in Western Europe. In Eastern Europe, it takes place much later. Um, the, the Haskalah, the Jewish Enlightenment, uh, I, may, I tried at some with some pains to to make the point uh, in the past that the Haskalah and the reform movement in Germany were not the same thing. They were independent movements, but related movements. The reform movement could not have come about without the Haskalah paving certain groundwork. 
but they were different identities. They were different. They they, they had different agenda. In the East, the Haskalah comes about much much later, just like the European Enlightenment, which the Haskalah was very much influenced by, obviously. Um, if you don't know what I mean by this term Haskalah, uh, or if you don't know what I mean by the term the Enlightenment or the European Enlightenment, you know, uh, a few minutes of Googling around or Wikipediaing around will do a lot to fill in any uh, gaps in your knowledge. Um, the Haskalah uh, was, just like the European Enlightenment, was uh, much later to make inroads in the East. Poland, Russia, etc., than it was in the West, France, Germany, etc. Uh, but both in the East and the West, the Haskalah, the Jewish Enlightenment, have uh, are, are taken note of by the secular governments, who are interested in changing the status of the Jew in their in their kingdoms in their countries. In the East. In Poland, in in uh, in Russia, again we spoke last week about how Poland, much of it uh, got gobbled up by Russia during the partitions of Poland in the 1790s. In the East, the Jews were, I'm speaking in gross oversimplifications, the Jews were surrounded by peasants, by drunks. Again, the peasants were drunks because they were usually paid in liquor, so. You know, perhaps through no fault of their own, uh, which was different, of course, than the condition in the West, in Germany, in France, and England, w which had art and which had culture and music and literature in a way that may have been appealing uh, uh, to Jews that wanted to enter that notion of cultured society, uh, things that were not present in the same way in Eastern Europe, which is not to say, obviously, that in, in Eastern Europe there wasn't the culture, uh, but a, a question of what the masses, the kind of culture that was available to the masses, and the type of society the Jew could imagine himself entering, uh, there were very different conditions between the East and the, and the West. But that's not to say that there was, pardon the expression, an iron curtain between them. Uh, there were points of interchange. Particularly, uh, particularly Galicia, uh, where my uh, my Elta Elta ladies and the Elta Bubbies come from. Uh, Galicia, you know, was this area uh, uh, between Central and Eastern Europe, uh, the western part of of uh, what today is the Ukraine, um, uh, which had been annexed by the by the Austro-Hungarian Empire was something of a channel between between East and West. It's an in, it's an important transit point uh, for ideas to get from, let's say, from Vienna, uh, the you know the, the the capital of Western culture and ideas and liberalism and and uh, and, uh, and and enlightenment and culture and higher education. Uh, into Galicia, and from there into into the Pale of Settlement, and ideas are transmitted, but they they take time, uh, they take on different forms as they make the transition, and they develop differently. The first maskil in Eastern Jewish society is the Ribal, is Yitzchak Bear Levinson. Again, he lived 1788 to 1860. Um, he's born in the in the Pale, at the very very uh, beginning of uh, of the Pale of Settlement in uh, in Russia, and then he spends time in Galicia and he makes acquaintance with certain intellectual circles, and in 1820, as a young man, he returns to the Pale with this idea of bringing back the ideas of the Haskalah to the backwater Jews of the of the Pale. 
in 18 uh, in the 1820s um, um, he publishes this work the Tudab Yisrael um, the Tudab Yisrael the, the title might mean something like the message to Udaz from the same Shoresh as the books of Western Enlightenment written in vernacular and Hebrew. Well, Sherry, you mean the, the books of the Haskalah, not the Western Enlightenment. The books of Western Enlightenment were written in written in whatever the you know, in largely in German or in French or etc. Um, the Haskalah was written most of their works were written in Hebrew. Um, some were written in Yiddish for polemical purposes to try to, to try to make inroads in communities that were only going to be reading uh, Yiddish. Um, the Tudab Yisrael, uh, Tudab is from the same show as, as aid, as testimony. Um, I, I, I once heard, I'm not sure this is true, someone with a philological bent can try to look it out. You know, Tudah in contemporary Hebrew means, uh, you know, like a report card or a diploma, a diploma. Uh, so it's an argument, among other things, although we didn't see it in the one paragraph we looked at, it's an argument for advancing secular education. So I, I once heard somebody say that, you know, the, the play in the, in, the, um, in the title was, uh, you know, Tudah Israel meant, uh, uh, you know, a diploma in Israel. But I'm not sure that that's how the term was used in the 1820s when the uh, when the book uh, was published in, in 18 in 1828. He had trouble getting it published because he um, because it was opposed by the Orthodox establishment or by the religious establishment it's in Eastern European in Eastern Europe. Uh, we can still only talk about the the religious establishment is synonymous with saying the Orthodox establishment at this at this point. Um, he begins with this emphasis on learning Hebrew, and again, who's he quoting? The Rambam, the Shlo, Chazal, etc. Um, and he makes this proposal of r returning to Hebrew as a pedagogical tool, which would of course been a radical change in the way uh, schooling and and study had been conventionally done, which was of course in in Yiddish. It was radical because the idea that we're going to dedicate time to studying diktuk, to studying grammar, uh, was it was uh, viewed at best at best as a Etelsman is a waste of time because it takes away time from traditional Talmud Torah, from traditional study of primarily Gemara and secondarily uh, Chumash, which were the meat and potatoes of conventional Cheder education in, in Eastern Europe. Um, but what's significant about how the work is put out is the is the extreme subtlety. The Haskalah in the East, which is addressing a far more traditional populace, is extremely subtle. It, it, it's it's a it's the Haskalah on a low flame. Um, the uh, you know and and because of that, it's view, he's viewed as a wolf in sheep's clothing. He's a masculine who is Maskil being a proponent of the Haskalah. Let me just put these terms up in Hebrew uh, here on the board. One second. No, well, that's not good because it's in yellow. Haskala, which is again the term for the for the Jewish Enlightenment, is from, of course, the Shoresh Seichel. You know that good Yiddish term that we use. It's really a Hebrew term, Seichel, uh, 
meaning intelligence, wisdom. A, a muscle is a adherent of the of the haskala. Um, he um, he he. he the innovation of a work like the Tuda Israel is using the the canon of traditional literature, the Gemara, the Rambam, the the the, uh, the Midrash, the Shla, etc., as a uh, as a an attempt to get traditional society to change. And it's done intentionally as a response to the audience, which is again a more traditional society. In in the West, the motivation of the Haskalah is to move towards a cultural change, towards the notion that if the Jews will somehow improve their you know their public image. Then the government will will respond in kind, will offer more freedoms and more liberties and more rights and more privileges. Um, in the in the uh, in the East, it's a different kind of agenda. Because of this, the Orthodox, of course, again view him as a as a wolf in sheep's clothing, as a masculine who can who can. Uh, who can quote the, Ram, the Rambam, but he himself, of course, is a very multifaceted person. Uh, uh, Levinson was, uh, he was a playwright and an author. I think he also wrote poetry. He wrote some very, um, some very biting uh, satirical, satirical works. Here's another passage from later in, in the same work, but here I have it in, uh, in English. Um, Again, this uh, these uh, scans are from uh, a work called uh, "The Jew in the Modern World," uh, edited by uh, by, uh, by Mendes Floor and Reinhardt, which is a, a documentary uh, uh, a collection of documents, primary sources. This is what he writes about Yiddish. The Yiddish, of course, being the primary language for all purposes in, in Eastern Europe. This language, which we speak here in this country, which we borrowed from the Germans and which is called Judeo-German, this language is completely corrupted. Yiddish is completely corrupted. This corruption is a consequence of the eclectic nature of the language. Yiddish, of course, was a language that, you know, kind of it was a mongrel. It, it took on so many different, it's a hodgepodge of so many different languages. A mixture of corrupted words taken from Hebrew, Russian, French, Polish, as well as from German, and even the German words are mispronounced and slurred. Moreover, this, our language, cannot serve us except for popular usage and simple conversations. If we wish to formulate concepts about higher things, Judeo-German, meaning Yiddish, will not suffice. Why Judeo-German? From these observations concerning the shortcomings of Yiddish, you will readily acknowledge the need to study at least one pure language and to know it well. Now again, this notion of a pure language, a language like Russian or German, which of course is, is not pure in the sense that there's no language which isn't influenced by surrounding languages, but a notion of a language which supports a culture a Western culture, a quote-unquote modern culture, which becomes the repository of, which becomes the repository of a literature and uh, a mode of commerce. Uh, that's what it means by a pure language. The the need to study one pure language and know it well. And there is no need to add that the language of the country we live in is doubtlessly the one we're obligated to learn correctly. Here again, he's speaking about Russian, but uh, but it would be true French in France and German in Germany that uh, the Jew should be fluent in the language of his host society. 
This we can ask. In this country, why speak Yiddish, either pure German or Russian? Not only is Russian the language of the country, it's also an especially pure and rich language. It is not lacking in pleasant tones or aesthetic form, and it contains all the elements considered necessary for the perfect language. Uh, uh, Natalia, uh, you're online with us. Uh, you're a native Russian speaker, born in, born in Moscow. Maybe you can weigh in on this. As I've explained at length in the instructions to my book in Hebrew, the elements of the Russian language, which I wrote for the benefit of Jewish youth and which I hope to publish soon if God grant me life. So he makes reference to a different book which he'd written but not yet published, which was a, a primer. It was a Hebrew language grammar book. Um, it's a Hebrew language grammar book uh, um, to help to help uh, it's a Hebrew language Russian grammar book to help the Jews learn and master and study and study Russian. Uh, James asks, is anyone credited with creating Yiddish? No. Yiddish is, uh, there are different uh, layers of Yiddish, there are different uh, periods in the development of Yiddish, and Yiddish developed differently uh, in, in, in Eastern Europe and Western Europe. There are different uh, dialects of Yiddish, although Jews anywhere, any kind of Yiddish they were speaking could easily understand any Yiddish speaker anyplace else. Uh, but Yiddish goes way, way back. Again, uh, the encyclopedia article on Yiddish will give you like more, more of the background history of Yiddish than you need. Is there anywhere you can now go to learn Yiddish? That is an interesting question. Uh, in the universities at Harvard, there's a, a very, um, probably the leading academic department in Yiddish is at Harvard. Uh, in New York, there's YIVO, um, Y-I-V-O, uh, the Yiddish Institute something. Let me see if I can. YIVO. Yeah, if, if you Google YIVO, Y-I-V-O, it's the first link that comes up. It's the, the Yiddish Institute, the YIVO Institute for Jewish Research. Uh, they certainly used to offer Yiddish. Probably in some uh, JCCs, they might have some Yiddish courses. Um, don't know if there's any Yiddish offered online. We don't offer it on Web Yeshiva, although if there were enough people interested in learning Yiddish, we would offer a course in Yiddish. So if you're interested, gather together a group and we'll offer a Yiddish course online here on the Web Yeshiva. You know, in various universities, there are Yiddish departments. Um, we may conclude from our discussion so far that it is a great obligation and necessity to know one of the foreign languages well, especially the language of the country where we live, and that we should know it perfectly so that we can articulate our thoughts in a correct manner. Now, to us, this may not seem at all surprising. It may not seem in any way, in any way radical. Um, uh, but in the 1820s, in the Pale of Settlement, it was extremely alarming. It was considered to be, it was considered to be radical. Um, everything that he says in the Tudab Israel had already been laid out, and then some, in its parallel work in the West. That work is the Divrei Shalom Ve'emet, uh, a work titled Divrei Shalom Ve'emet, The Words of Peace and Truth, which was written uh, by Naftali Hertz Weisel, or Wesley, who was a, um, a colleague of Moses Mendelssohn, and had been written in Germany 40 years earlier. Uh, the, the, the Haskalah in Russia is only getting off the ground with a 40-year-plus delay. Um, and, and everything that he says here had already been said in that work, the Divrei Shalom Ve'emet. I saw, I just noticed in the archives that we, that there's a recording of that whole, uh, that whole session 
where we talked about the directional environment, and you might want to revisit that. But um, but Weisel and the directional environment in Russia would have never succeeded because it was even more radical. It was even more uh, pushing the edge. You may recall that Weisel talked about the difference between Torah Hashem and Torah Adam, the Torah of God and the Torah of man, meaning there's you study the Gemara and the Chomish, and then the Torah Adam is the secular studies, and that distinction would have seemed even more radical in the in the in the East. Um, Levinson claims that his plan isn't a threat to the rabbinic tradition, but is actually he makes this claim it's a return to it's a return to tradition itself, and and that's why he starts off with bolstering his, his argument with these quotes from uh, traditional sources. Um, and, and in a sense, it might have been. Uh, the idea that we're going to study Hebrew is, after all, not exactly like suggesting we should all be eating bacon. Um, it's not suggesting that we should be reforming the prayer service or the synagogue or uh, the sachakoli, suggesting that we study uh, Hebrew diktuk, which is today not, uh, not at all uh, surprising. Um, no, so the denigration of Yiddish was for two reasons. One was Yiddish is Yiddish is such a is viewed as such a pigeon jargonistic um, uh, um, particularistic language of the Jews, where if you're only fluent in Yiddish. It means you're cutting yourself off from general society. And part of the agenda of the Haskalah is to open Jews to general society. So the argument that we should we should study another language like German or Russian means that we can then open the conduits to the influences of general society and culture. The idea that we should study Hebrew that the that are internal language it should be Hebrew, uh, uh, which is considered a more uh, classical language, which is considered a more refined and cultured language, you know, is part of this attempt to refine the image of the backward shtetl Jew to something more refined, cultured, etc. Uh, Correct. In other words, Yiddish is the thing that kept the Eastern European Jew peasant-like, because he was shut off from from everything else. Um, if you compare uh, Weisel in Berlin to Levinson in Russia, despite the 40-year difference, in Berlin, in Berlin, in in the 1780s. I think Debrecht Shalom Vemet comes out in 1782. Weisel was already, while the book was being printed, Weisel was considered uh, uh, conservative, conservative with a, with a, with a lowercase c, um, by the younger masculum of his day. Um, when you compare him to Levinson, he's, objectively speaking, he's far more radical, but Levinson, in his own time, in his own place, is considered to be incredibly radical. Levinson in Berlin, even 40 years earlier, would have been considered old-fashioned. The Udabi Israel asks five different questions. Uh, and, and again, now from our perspective, they don't seem that radical. He asks, one is this question about the essential nature of studying Hebrew grammatically. Number two is uh, the permissibility of studying foreign languages, Russian or German. And that gets him to point number three, which is the question of studying generally secular subjects. Number four, uh, the advantages to studying sciences and languages. And number five is a general analysis of the question of the advantages and disadvantages, or an argument that the advantages outweigh any disadvantages 
to studying general, general studies, secular studies, secular languages. The whole idea that he has to you know, make that argument about admitting to disadvantages and making an argument that the advantages outweigh the disadvantages is again coming from this very, this very kind of uh, conservative uh, uh, point of view and knowing to whom he's speaking. The book apparently had a very strong impact on, on Russian Jewry and there were groups that were formed to, to study the proposals. The biggest audience, however, was, of course, the government of the Tsar itself. Um, in 1823, uh, uh, Nicholas I, who was the heir apparent, he, he was not yet the uh, he was not yet the Tsar. He only becomes the Tsar in 1825. Alexander I was, we spoke about him last time, Alexander I was the Tsar from 1801 to 1825, and Nicholas takes over in 1825. Um, he becomes very interested in it, and uh, and then at a certain point he uh, gets involved in promoting the manuscript and ultimately getting it published, I think even financing the publication. Uh, so there's this idea that the, the Russian government itself is behind the Haskala in order to grease the wheels of leading towards Jewish, uh, you know, on one hand you could say Jewish reform, on the other hand you could say assimilation. Um, in the 1830s, uh, Levinson is asked to make proposals uh, to the government on how to modify Jewish religious life. Um, he becomes very much isolated from the Jewish community. He becomes ostracized. Um, later, he proposes closing down Jewish printing in the Pale of Settlement, uh, unless the, the printing houses would be under government control and government censorship. That proposal, I think, was ultimately accepted at a certain point in certain places, and he he tries to uh, he tries to uh, stop the printing of all Hasidic literature, which you can imagine was viewed as particularly uh, backwards thinking. Um, this, of course, comes at a, at a at a time period when Hasidut is really taking off, like like a house on fire, uh, and this idea to try to tamp that down. Um, of course, Hasidim were the most resistant to to the proposals for enlightenment and and reform, uh, the most hostile, um, and the most uh, most negative towards any type of government interference. Um, there's a blacklisting of, of, of certain books and things like that. At the end of the 1830s, in 1838, he makes a full-fledged plan for reform that's a different work called the Beit Yehuda, um, which proposes uh, secular Jewish schools, uh, types of secular theological seminaries um, with government uh, control. He makes a plan that a third of Russian Jewry should enter agriculture. This goes back to what we spoke about last time, about a, a, a um, desire to move Jews into what were considered productive lines of work, uh, producing food being a very severe necessity, uh, always in, in Russian history. Um, the, the Jews are, of course, reluctant to leave the Pale of Settlement. Uh, there was this idea, of course, that Jews would be open to being moved out of the Pale of Settlement if they were engaging in productive uh, trades or if they were engaged in agriculture and farming. Jews were, of course, very reluctant to leave the, the Pale of Settlement, and um, and that's the you know the career of uh, of the Ribal Yitzchak Bear of Yitzchak Bear Levinson. Um, were the Jews Russian citizens? Well, I mean, yes and no. The, 
they were citizens in the sense that they belonged to the they belonged to the government of Russia, but uh, Russia didn't. I mean, e even the the serfs. Uh, Russia was a feudalistic society until the 1860s. I think the I think the serfs are not completely emancipated in Russia until 1868. Um, uh, so, what does it mean to be a citizen? I mean. They couldn't vote, but nobody could vote. <laughs> they didn't have, you know, they, they didn't elect the Tsar. Um, they had certain protections. Uh, if they were allowed to live there, they were they were entitled to certain protections. But the whole idea of asking whether they citizens is uh, is an anachronistic kind of question. This isn't uh, this isn't France or England. Um, the it's a little. Um, you know, we always have to be careful when we do this uh, to, to turn to a work of the imagination, whether it's literature or art. It's certainly film, but you know, the the the, the quickest uh, touchstone for us, or or, or most uh, I guess common frame of reference, you know, think of Anna Tefka, think of Fiddler on the Roof. I mean, if you can think of Fiddler on the Roof, if you can think of if you can actually think of the Shalom Aleichem stories of Tevya, that's better than if you can just think of the movie or the play. But uh, but even if all you can do is conjure up the movie or the play, which are set later than this, it takes place quite a few decades, quite a few decades later. But uh, but that idea of the the Jewish attachment to tradition. Uh, that that's the pole star around which a figure like Tevya organizes his life, the tumult that his life is thrown into when things come along from within and from without that shake up that sense of tradition of the way things are, the way things have always been, um, and then ultimately having to be banished from his home, from the from the Pale of Settlement, uh, and not really wanting to go, um, even though things weren't really so great there. But this notion of the the gravity uh, and weight and pull of of tradition. This is again, it's a it's a kind of cheap shorthand by which we can we can and conjure up an association. This is the society that you know before before those. Uh, rebellious sons-in-law come along and try to change things. Uh, the opening scene of Fiddler on the Roof. You can understand why even a modest proposal like the Tudab Yisrael, which is far less radical than the proposals made in, in, uh, in Western Europe, and which to our eyes today don't seem so radical. We can understand why they were viewed with such severe, uh, with such severe um, um, suspicion. Uh, and that is the rough outline of how the Haskalah comes to the East. Of course, it plays itself out over the decades in interesting ways, which we will have to see in uh, subsequent and uh, subsequent discussions. There were, of course, other factors. Um, complicating life of Jews in the Pale of Settlement, and we will talk about some of them when we meet again next week. So thank you all for joining in. Um, you should have my email because they send out those automated emails uh, uh, etc. but I'll put it up again in the chat. And thanks to all of you that took the time to Drop me a note after last week uh, to just fill me in on who you are. I, there, I'm very, very pleased, of course, that there are so many new people uh, in the class. I don't know, again, whether you're new to, to Web Yeshiva altogether or just to my classes, but I'm glad that you're here, and I'd like to get to know you. If you're in the Yerushalayim area, I'd like to get to know you in person. I'd be glad to meet you for a cup of coffee or something. And... Um,
and if not, so then to just uh, be in touch by, by email. Yes, Brian, I will pass you the mic. How's this? Can you hear me now? Yes, huh? I can hear you. I can hear you. I can hear you. I can hear you. Oh, fantastic. How do I sound? You sound fine. <laughs> okay. where, now, where are you? I'm sorry, guys. So I'm where are you? Oh, I'm in uh, Champaign, Illinois. I, I work at the University of Illinois here. Oh, what do you do? Uh, I, I do com uh, I do computer and networking stuff. <laughs> uh -huh. 